Okay, so we are about to start our Labor Day holiday with our best friend, the Buddha. Okay, Buddha is a very good uh, friend to have on a holiday. He doesn't complain. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we'll spend, uh, you know, the next three days just kind of learning from the Buddha and, uh, you know, taking it in, uh, testing it, seeing if it makes sense, uh, trying it out to see if it works. Uh -huh. And uh, we'll be using a book that is uh, in the Chinese Tripitaka. It's not in the Tibetan Tripitaka. I have no idea why. I think it should be. It's a, a very good book. It's um, Nagarjuna's commentary on the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Okay, so the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is a very important sutra. Nagarjuna was one of the foremost uh, Indian sages, and so for him to write a commentary on that is quite impressive. Uh, so this book is only chapters uh, 17 to 30. <laughs> There's many more chapters. It, it's quite a big thing. Uh, and last week, or, sorry, last year, I started teaching the section on the six paramitas, or the six uh, perfections. So these are six practices that are done by bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are uh, those who with uh, very profound uh, love and compassion impartially for all sentient beings, uh, seek to um, actualize their own potential, uh, to, you know, purify their mind of hindrances, develop all their good qualities so that they can become fully awakened beings for the benefit of all the rest of us who are kind of messed up. Okay, but we have that potential to uh, become Buddha, bodhisattvas and then Buddhas too. Do you think we're messed up? Yeah? Do you think personally you have, you're messed up inside? Not maybe in every aspect of your life, but maybe a little bit? Yeah? Like you get angry sometimes? Yeah? I know it's always somebody else's fault when you get angry, always. But maybe you want to consider that your mind has something to do with your anger. Hmm? So, uh, you know, just, just consider that as we, uh, you know, explore what the Buddha said through Nagarjuna's explanation. So... Uh, we'll be doing it here in the dining room. Yeah. So I know that you thought, oh, we're going to a monastery. We'll have a beautiful meditation room, a beautiful teaching room. Yeah. And then you come and it's a dining room. Okay. Well, there's a reason for this. Um, our meditation hall is the log cabin over there. And uh, we've been using it for 19 years, but it's gotten too small. And especially during this weather, to have so many people in that building, which is converted from a garage, um, I think it would be more like a, a sauna than uh, a meditation course if we were all in there. So we are relocated here. Okay, and then you have to eat outside, and you know, everything's not quite so perfect. Um, but if you walk a little bit, you'll see a great big hole out there. And uh, that great big hole is going to be where the new Buddha Hall will be built. And uh, it seems like on Tuesday they will be uh, laying out the footings which means that later in the week, hopefully, 
they'll have the big concrete trucks up here pouring the footings. Yeah, so that gets really exciting, especially when they try and come up the S-curve. Um, but, you know, this is what we're doing because we, uh, you know, we really need it in order to be able to host activities like this. If it was just us, at least right now, we wouldn't need it. But it's because we want to um, share the Dharma with other people and enable you to come and, and uh, you know, have a residential retreat that uh, we're enlarging everything. So, yeah, take a look at the hole, but don't fall in it, please. Okay, they put lots of caution tape and fence and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, at the beginning of the sessions, we will be doing some chanting. Uh, and the purpose of the chanting is to help us focus on good ideas, good thoughts. It's The purpose is to um, point out, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so the one, you know, the one set of prayers that we do will be We'll be paying homage to the Buddha and chanting some of his qualities and the qualities of the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, and the Sangha, the monastic. Uh, well, actually, here the Sangha is those who have the realizations of the teachings. And uh, so we'll be chanting that. Then we make an offering. You know, uh, if you see people doing, it looks like making pretzels with their fingers. Uh, they're not actually. This is a way of making offering. Uh, somebody will explain it tomorrow, right? In the break time, somewhere. And uh, and then we we uh, you know set our motivation. Uh, the motivation is really so important in what we're doing, and this is very much a reversal of. Uh, how we usually are in the world, okay? Usually in the world, uh, nobody particularly cares about their motivation. We care more about how we look to other people, whether other people will praise us or blame us, whether we'll have a good reputation or a bad reputation. <clears throat> But according to Buddhism, the things that we do to get praise or blame, good or bad reputation, you know, what, what, in a worldly way, what we consider those things, we, ju we judge them good or bad, okay? But from a Buddhist viewpoint, it's our motivation that determines the value of what we do. Yeah, so... The idea being that we know how to pull the wool over other people's eyes. Yeah, sometimes even over our own eyes, we don't, we aren't even aware of our own motivation. But if our motivation is one of uh, clinging attachment, anger, resentment, revenge, jealousy, arrogance, things like that, then any action we do, even if it's an action that other people praise us for doing, it still becomes a non-virtuous action by the power of our motivation. Yeah. Similarly, uh, we may do certain actions that other people don't like, but if we do them with a positive motivation out of care and concern and compassion for others, even though other people may criticize us, we can have the confidence that what we're doing is good and not let their criticism take us, you know, affect us. So one of the examples I, I like to give, it's quite a simple example, but it's, it's quite telling. Okay, if you take a charity let's say a charity that wants to build a hospital 
in an impoverished area. Yeah. And so one person uh, gives a million dollars to build the hospital. Well, everybody goes, wow, he's so generous. This is fantastic. You know, oh, this is wonderful. And we, we just love him and so, so kind, so generous. But in the back of his mind, this person is thinking, well, I gave a big donation and uh, they'll put my name in the lobby of the hospital and maybe even um, name a room or an operating room or a department after me. Okay? But people say, wow, he's so generous. Then there's somebody else who gives $20 and they're thinking, uh, their motivation is may everybody who comes to this hospital be healed from their illness or their injury. Yeah? And he gives $20. Well, nobody pays attention to the person who gave $20. Everybody thinks the guy who gave a million is so generous. But if you look at the motivation, who was the generous person? Was the guy who's doing it so that uh, something can be named after him? Yeah. Or so that he can get credit in the hospital news yet letter for being generous? Uh, was he, in fact, being generous? Yeah. And what about the person who gave $20 that everybody ignored? Yeah. Wasn't that person the one with the, with the generous motivation? Okay, so the point here is, again, it's not how things look in a worldly way. It depends on what's going on inside of us yeah, that motivates our actions. And so that's why uh, all throughout this weekend, um, at the beginning of almost every activity, we will stop and we will generate our motivation. So the motivation we may generate is contrived. Maybe we don't feel impartial love and compassion for everybody, but we think about it at least. And we aspire to have that meditation, that motivation. And we start to open our mind to maybe viewing other people in a different way so that we can begin to, to uh, act with compassion for everybody. Okay? So even just thinking about it, uh, generating it, compassion, um, Artif you know, an artificial kind of compassion, that's okay. We're, we're planting seeds in our mind stream. Yeah? And that process of planting seeds is, is quite important. You know, we're familiarizing ourselves with a new way of thinking. Okay? Now, if you're happy with your old way of thinking and you think all your emotions are fantastic, and all your emotions uh, bring you delight, okay, you don't need to do this. But, you know, some of us are what my, one of my teachers called yo-yos. Okay, remember yo-yos when you were a kid? The toy that went down and it went up and it went down and went up. So very often, emotionally, we are like yo-yos. Okay, somebody praises us, somebody criticizes us, somebody compliments us, somebody puts us down, we get what we want, somebody interferes with us getting what we want. I like the food, I can't stand the food. Okay. Yeah? Is this ringing the bell for some people? Are you kind of like an, a yo-yo? Yeah? And so um, what it means is that when other people see us, they're not quite sure who they're going to see that day. Because if we're in a good mood, they see 
one person. And if we're in a bad mood, they see another person. Okay? And it's because, you know, our emotions are fluctuating like this. And our emotions are a product of our thoughts. Okay? This is a little bit different than how we usually think. We usually think thoughts are one thing, emotion are, are another. And we usually think emotions, you don't have any control over. If you feel it, you feel it, and it just kind of arose, especially if it's a powerful one, and there's nothing you can do, yeah? Or you self-medicate if it's a ne negative emotion, okay? And you know how we all self-medicate. Yeah. Everybody has their own variety of self-medication. Drinking and drugging are very popular ones. Shopping, yeah, comes in close. Uh, um, what do you call it? Um, surfing the internet, drowning yourself in sci-fi movies. Uh, you know, we have lots of ways of just kind of trying to uh, calm our minds, but um, most of them don't work so well. You know? And some of them actually turn out to be quite damaging. You know? If you're drinking and drugging as a way to, to deal with emotions, it, it doesn't turn out good. So what we're trying to do here, you know, is understand our own minds and see how our emotions, and one way to understand our minds, is to see how our emotions uh, arise from how we look at a situation, how we think about a situation, how we interpret what's going on. Okay, so our emotions aren't just, you know, bam, they happen, and there's nothing you can do, and just let it all be there, because if you try and control them, you're suppressing them, and that's bad. Okay? Uh, no, we're trying to look. When we have a certain emotion, what kind of thoughts are behind it? What kind of expectations do we have? And many of these expectations, we... Are many of them we're not even aware of ourselves, much less articulate them to the other people who we expect to fulfill our expectations. So this often brings a lot of problems, you know, but the more we're able to see the thoughts and how they bring certain emotions, then we can start to change how we look at situations which uh, influences how we feel about them, okay? And one, um, yeah, one way to, to see how this works, okay? If I can use Venerable Semke as an example, yeah, if somebody walks in this room and looks at Venerable Semke, she looks so sweet sitting there right now, doesn't she? Yeah, but this person's mad and says, Venerable Semke, you know, what are you doing? Yeah, you're in charge of the forest. You're in charge of the vegetable garden. You're in charge of the flower garden. And there's weeds all over. And there's broken branches in the forest. And we have, we're clogged with dead trees. And it's all going to catch fire. And this is because you are negligent at your job. Why don't you get it together, kid? You know, you're just not doing anything. Okay, so somebody comes in the room, says that to her. I won't tell you who. Um, <laughs> um, but, but I'm Venerable Semke's friend, and she's getting upset. She's hearing that stuff. She's getting upset, okay, because she's thinking... Wait a minute, you know, I have so much to do. Why doesn't somebody help me? Uh, why are you blaming me? If you don't like it, you do it. 
you know, how we usually think when, when somebody lays it on us. Uh, but so she's getting upset, and I can see that she's turning red. So I go over. I say, "Venerable Sam K, it's okay. Just chill out. That person is unhappy. They're miserable right now. We don't really know what's making them miserable, but they're taking it out on you by dumping their anger on you." Okay, so really what's happening has very little to do with you. Yeah, it has mostly to do with that person being in a bad mood. Okay, and uh, you know, you look at yourself, you're doing the best you can, and yes, there's always room for improvement, but you're, you're really doing very good, um, but you could do better. Um, <laughs> No, no, you don't say that. I'm her friend, and I'm saying, you know, <laughs> I said, you know, don't worry about it. It's okay. Yeah, it's no big deal. Don't get upset. Now, okay. Now, if that same person comes in the room and looks at me and says the exact same words, yeah. Am I going to think it's no big deal that it's just that person being unhappy and taking it out on me? No way! You know, who are you talking to me that way, accusing me of something that I didn't do? You know, why are you venting on me anyway? You know, kind of, oh, it, I'm, and, okay? So when they say that to her, it's, you know, I'm not upset at all, and I, and I try and calm her down. But when the person says the same thing to me, this is bordering on national catastrophe, and I cannot let it pass. Because if I don't say something back, you know, they're going to keep dumping their anger at me again and again and again. So I am ticked off. Okay, now what's the difference? The person said the same words looking at her as they said looking at me. Why when they look at her, I say, it's not a big deal, don't get upset. Yet when they look at me and say the same words, this is a really horrible situation I've got to deal with. What's the difference? It, the difference is, who are they criticizing? Yeah. If they're criticizing somebody else, it's not a big deal. If they're criticizing me, it is a huge deal. Okay. Now, why is that? Why should I be perfectly serene when they criticize her, but really upset when they criticize me. Yeah, it's my reputation, isn't it? It's not just a reputation, it's my reputation. And whose reputation do I think is most important? Mine. Of course. Everybody should know that. Yeah. My feelings are the most important. Yeah. Her feelings, not so. she's my friend, so they're kind of important, you know. But my feelings are more important. So everybody should really understand that and not criticize me. Okay. So you see the thought that's lying behind my anger, the thought is, I am the most important person. And there's another thought that says, my reputation is who I am. So if somebody trashes my reputation, it means I'm a bad person. I don't want to be a bad person. Okay, so if I really stop and look, there's all sorts 
of thoughts lying behind my anger. Okay. And it's very interesting to notice what they are and then to ask myself if those thoughts are true or not. Because, yeah, Q is not the only source of conspiracy theories. And neither is Alex Jones or Dear Donnie or whoever else we choose to blame for their conspiracy theories. Our own mind makes up conspiracy theories, makes up falsehoods, lies. Okay, if I think I'm more important than anybody else, is that something that is factually true? Yeah, if I took that to court, what's the judge gonna say? Yeah, judge is gonna say, get out of here, I'm more the most important one in the world. <laughs> yeah. So I'm making up all sorts of things that are not true and holding them tightly and expecting the world to act according to them. So I uh, often call these my uh, rules of the universe. Mm -hmm. Different thoughts, expectations I have that I do, um, like I said, I'm not even always conscious of, but I expect the universe to conform to. Okay, so you might see if you have any of these rules of the universe, these kinds of thoughts. Okay, so it starts with, I am the most important one. My happiness is more important than anybody else's. My suffering hurts more than anybody else's. Everything I want should be given to me. I am entitled to it. I deserve it. If people get in the way of my happiness, they deliberately do this because they're bad, rotten people. My anger is always justified. My anger is never unjustified. It is always justified. Okay. When I compete with somebody, I better win because I'm always the best. And when I lose, okay, when, or when I make a mistake, it's somebody else's fault. Yeah. So if I make a mistake, don't blame me. I'm not the source of my own mistakes. It's because somebody else did something. Okay? But me, I am always benevolent, kind, responsible. Okay? I treat people fairly. So all this criticism that comes my way, it's just other people's junk because they're jealous. And on and on and on. And we make up all these kinds of scenes. Yeah. And then these are rules of the universe. And then we interpret other people's actions in terms of them and justify, you know, we justify our greed, we justify our anger, our jealousy, our resentment, our pride and arrogance. Yeah. And even though those emotions uh, function in a way to cause us many problems with other people, we still think that they're, they're good and they're justified. Okay. So, uh, chew on that a bit. 
Mm -hmm. huh? And the first thing that will happen is your mind will say, yes, but, okay, watch the yes buts. Yeah. You will learn a lot about yourself when you hear yourself say, yes, but. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah, I'll agree, but, but, yeah, my way of thinking, my wants and needs, those are the most important. Okay, and then, you know, we can see this play out in our daily lives as we have conflicts with other people. Yeah. And as we go through life uh, feeling misunderstood, yeah. feeling uh, pity for ourselves, yeah. feeling like we're a victim, of other people's wrong ideas when we're actually the recipient of our own wrong ideas. <laughs> okay. So what we're, we're trying to do here is to really look at how our mind works and learn to evaluate our own actions. Yeah. Okay. So not to evaluate our own actions in the sense of you know, well, I don't need to evaluate them because they're always right and they're always good. But because if we are, if we are able to evaluate ourselves, then we are not going to be so dependent on what other people think about us. And our sensitivity to what other people think about us causes us a lot of pain. Don't you agree? Yeah? How we're always like, do they like me? Do they not like me? What are they saying about me? Do they agree with me? Do they not agree with me? Are they talking behind my back because they think I'm rotten, but they're being nice to my face? No. Am I awful like some people tell me I am? Or am I good like other people tell me I am? I don't know. Yeah. And so we look to other people to tell us who we are. Yeah. And that is totally crazy-making. Because people will tell us opposite things about ourselves. And I have... Some of you have heard some of my stories before. Just chill out. <laughs> uh, but... One of the things that where I really saw this happened many years ago. Uh, I was living in a monastic community in France, and one morning, one other nun came to see me and said, "You know, we were talking, and she said, "Oh, you're such a good nun. You're such a good example. You keep your precepts very well." You know, you really have a lot of devotion. You're kind to other people. Ooh, she's talking about me. Mm. Yeah. Then she left. Then somebody else came in and said, you are the worst example of a competent nun that I can think of. You make so many mistakes. Your ethical conduct is sloppy. You know, you got to get it together and start acting properly for a nun. And this all happened within about a half an hour or an hour on the same day. Now, if my self-esteem depended on what other people thought about me, then who, do, who am I going to believe? Yeah? Yeah? Well, I want to believe the person who says I'm wonderful. But also, I don't have such good self-confidence, so I often tend to be believe the person that criticizes me. But if I'm really that bad, why is this other person saying how good I am? But if I was really that wonderful, why doesn't the 
other person praise me too. And we go get absolutely crazy. Yeah? Am I somebody worthy of, of praise or am I somebody who messes things up? And we have no ability to judge ourselves. Not judge, I should say, evaluate ourselves. Because we're not used to looking at what our motivation is. Yeah. If we start looking at what our motivation is, then, you know, that would help a lot in trying to understand uh, the feedback we get from other people. Because sometimes I have a rotten motivation and it's adversely affecting somebody. Yeah. And so they point it out to me in no uncertain terms. Okay. Sometimes they may criticize me, but if I look inside, my motivation for whatever action I did that they don't like I was actually one where I was trying to help, yeah, where I had a good motivation. But they misunderstood. Okay. But if every time somebody criticizes me, I get down, and every time somebody praises me, I go up, yeah, then I'm totally out of touch with what's happening here. And what are my real motivations? Are my motivations praiseworthy, or are they worthy of criticism? Yeah. And if they're worthy of criticism, why do I get so defensive when people point them out? Okay? It's like people saying, you have a nose on your face, especially when they say that to me. I don't have a dainty little nose. I have a big, fat nose. So somebody says, you have a nose on your face. What am I going to do? Say no. Yeah. What am I going to do? Say no. Well, yeah, maybe. But it's my dad's fault. I have my dad's nose. Yeah, blame my dad. It's not, it's not my fault that I haven't been there. No. Somebody says what's true. It's true. I say, yeah, I know I have a big nose. Yeah. And so did my brother, and he had the nose job, and I didn't. And you know what? I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. I'm having a memory of when my brother was um, talking about that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, if, if we can be honest with ourselves, yeah, somebody says you have a big nose, you say yes. Somebody said you made a mistake, you say yes. I made a mistake. But then we always say yes but you have to understand that it really wasn't my fault. It was because somebody else did this and that and the other thing. And I was just coming in and trying to help it because they didn't do their responsibility. When I came in, it didn't turn out well. And I'm the one who gets blamed because I'm always the one who gets blamed. Yeah. So, you know, feel sorry for me a little bit. Come on. Yeah. I want some pity. Or at least some understanding. Somebody say, oh, poor you. Yes, the world really is mean to you. And then I can go, yes, it's terrible. I, nobody appreciates me. Yeah, and then we, you know, act out another one of our scenes. Okay, so if we know... Uh, how to our, assess our own actions, then, you know, if something's true, it's true. I own it. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean I'm a good person. I'm just owning it. Yeah, no reason to get down on myself, no reason to 
get arrogant. Okay. So I was going to start teaching this book today, but somehow I got sidetracked. Maybe we better do that when we cultivate our motivation. So in all spiritual traditions and in just regular secular life, everybody appreciates kindness. And everybody appreciates when that kind of kindness manifests as generosity. And so often we think of the person who receives the generosity and the kindness of others as the fortunate per person. And that's true. But the person who is really fortunate is the person who is generating kindness, who has a generous mind. Because that person's heart is open, it's relaxed, and so it's joyful. So make the aspiration, may I, too, generate kindness, a kind attitude towards others. And may I learn to be generous, not only because that brings me happiness, but because it brings others happiness too. And through increasing my kindness and my generosity, May I make a positive contribution to society and to whoever I come in contact with. And may I finally develop my kindness and generosity to the fullest so that they are those of a fully awakened being. So generate that aspiration. So it can be very helpful uh, to us along that line to imagine having a kind heart. Yeah, even though you know we may not feel that way towards everybody, but to imagine what would it feel like if we could have a feeling of kindness towards everybody, have an attitude that wishes everybody well. Yeah. Would you be a lot happier if you had that kind of attitude towards others? Yeah, we would, wouldn't we? Because that critical, judgmental mind that is always afraid of what others are going to do to us, yeah, that mind it makes us quite unhappy. If you think about it, yeah, we think that mind protects us from harm, but actually, it makes us unhappy. So again, think about this in terms of your own experience. Don't just take my word for it. So last year we started uh, talking about the six perfections as Nagarjuna explained them. And so these are all based on having a kind heart, you know, having a, an attitude of love, which means wishing others to have happiness in its causes, 
and an attitude of compassion, wishing them to be free of suffering and its causes. So this text was written quite a number of years ago, okay, in a society that is very different than ours. But uh, all human beings are, we operate in a very similar way. So even though certain cultural things uh, may not match, the points behind them match. Okay. And again, you just see, you check it out for yourself. So the six perfections, or the six, sometimes they're called far-reaching attitudes. They're, they're called far-reaching because they bring us from where we are now, they reach far to the other shore, the other shore being fully full development, yeah, full actualization of ourselves as uh, altruistic, wise human beings. Okay? So uh, there's six of them. First one's generosity. Okay? The second one's ethical conduct. The third one is sometimes called patience. But I don't like that translation because... When I think of patience, I, th I think of waiting for somebody to hurry up and do something. And that's not the meaning of this. Yeah, It's more an attitude of inner strength. Yeah. I call it fortitude. Yeah. It's, a, it's an inner strength to be able to endure criticism or suffering or whatever kind of difficulties uh, we encounter. Okay. The fourth one is called joyous effort. Fifth one is called meditative stability. So the ability to hold the mind steady and concentrate in meditation. And then the sixth one is wisdom. So last year we started talking about generosity, we didn't get very far. Um, and so this year we will continue talking about generosity. It doesn't matter that you weren't here last year. I think everybody uh, has some feeling for generosity. And, uh, you know, it's something that is praised in the world by all spiritual traditions and even by people who have no spiritual tradition. Everybody thinks sharing generosity is something good. Yeah? And and we say generosity ourselves. We appreciate it. Yeah? But I don't know about you. I uh, sometimes run across some hindrances to being able to be generous. Do you have any hindrances to being generous? Yeah? Few people are, are nodding their heads, yes. A few of you are looking like, who, me? <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> yeah, so we might as well all admit it. Okay. So there's different kinds of generosity uh, that we talk about. One is generosity with material things. <clears throat> yeah. Another is, uh, and that's what we usually think of as generosity. Another one is uh, generosity that provides safety, that helps people be without fear. Okay, so it's a generosity of our time and effort, uh, you know, to protect people from danger. There's also the generosity of uh, what they call reverence, of seeing other people's good qualities and remarking on them, yeah, and praising other people for their good qualities. And then there's the generosity of sharing the Dharma teachings with others. And there's probably many other kinds of generosity as well. Okay, so 
we may be talking about some that you think of, and, and you can add on to, uh, you know, those that I'm not mentioning. Okay. So I'm going to start with one section. It's calling, it's uh, called Material Giving and Dharma Giving. Okay, so giving material things, money, you know, possessions, these kinds of things. And then giving the Dharma. Here, Dharma means the Buddha's teaching specifically, but it can mean um, giving wise words to others. Yeah sharing wise words that will help other people solve their own problems and balance their mind. Okay, so the uh, first thing is to compare these two, material giving and then get the giving of the Dharma. So the question the Gajana poses, which he's going to answer, is which is supreme, the giving of material wealth or the giving of the Dharma? Okay. Now, what do you think? Yeah. It's going to depend on what you're used to, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, giving material wealth. Yes, I would like if people gave a lot of that to me. Uh, my giving uh, material wealth to others? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. But not too much. I have to be realistic. Because if I give it to others, I won't have. And then the giving of Dharma, you know, sharing any kind of wisdom that, that we may have that can help people in their lives. So that's the question. So Nagarjuna uh, responds to his own question. He says, according to the words of the Buddha, among the two kinds of giving, giving of dharma is supreme. Why is that? The result from giving of the giving of material wealth is experienced within the desire realm. Okay, when we talk of the Buddha's cosmology, we talk of three realms: the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. The form and formless realms are states of very deep samadhi, meditative concentration. We live in the desire realm, don't you think? Is desire prominent in our, in our minds, in our society, in the world? You bet it is. You know, everything is based on desire. And we are taught to have more desire and to desire things that we initially didn't even desire. That's what advertising is. Yeah, To make you want things that you don't need, that use up more than our fair share of the world's resources, that may bring you happiness for five minutes, and then clutters your home. Okay, that, that, that's the you know, the result of, of uh, desire for material goods in consumer materialistic societies. Yeah, in impoverished societies it's different, but this is the world we live in. Okay, so the, re the result resulting from, uh, the result coming from the giving of the Dharma may be experienced either within the three realms or beyond the three realms. Within the three realms means within cyclic existence, the world that uh, where we get born again and again under the influence of ignorance. And when he says uh, beyond the three realms, it means a state of uh, you know when you're really on the path and transforming your mind and you have uh, insight into the nature of reality. Okay, so the result of material giving is experienced within the desire realm. Yeah, 
the result of giving the Dharma is a, can be experienced in all three realms, but also in the states of, uh, of the highly realized beings. Moreover, if one's discourse is pure, if it reaches deeply into the principles that the Buddha taught, if one's mind also realizes it, then on that account one reaches beyond the three realms. Okay, so what's beyond the three realms? Okay, what we're teaching is pure, it's profound, and our mind has understood it well, and we're practicing it in our own lives. Okay. Whereas the giving of material wealth is measurable, the giving of the Dharma is immeasurable. Material giving is such as can be exhausted. Yeah, because you give things and then you might run out after a while. Okay. Um, the giving of Dharma, however, is inexhaustible because it's not form and it's just giving from your heart because you care. It is analogous to increasing the intensity of a fire through the addition of more fuel. Its brightness becomes yet greater. So that's the giving of the Dharma. Okay. Uh, the result gained from the giving of material wealth, uh, there is relatively less purity and more defilement. The uh, result gained from the giving of the Dharma, there's relatively less defilement and more purity. Okay. If one engages in the giving of material wealth, one depends on the power of many others. Yeah, because how do we get the, the material things that we give? It because it's because other people give them to us in one way or another. Okay. If you fear going broke, please remember that when all of us were born, we were born broke. Okay. We were born totally broke. We didn't have a nickel to our name. Okay. Everything we have now, where did it come from? It came from through the efforts of other living beings. Yeah. Well, well you, you know, we may say, but, 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 well, wait a minute here. I worked hard and I bought my car. So I earned it. It's mine through my labor. Well, think again. Did you make the car? Does anybody know how to make a car here? Does anybody know how to, can we mine the metal that goes into making the car? Can, do we know how to build the computer chips in the car? Do we know how to make the plastic that, uh, you know, the plastic uh, seat covers that we have? Uh, you know, if left to our own devices, could we make a car and give ourselves a car? No way. No way. We only have a car because other people worked hard. And then, you know, we went into some store and we gave them a, a piece of plastic and they gave us a car. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? You give them a piece of plastic, and they even give you your plastic back. They don't hang on to it, so you can reuse it. And you get a car. That's pretty good, isn't it? And who worked hard to, to make the car? Not me. Yeah. I put in a little bit of work here and there at a job and, you know, and they gave me, uh, yeah, they gave me something that is immaterial. It goes directly in my bank account and I never see it, but I have it. 
Yeah. They used to give me pieces of paper, and I had to take the pieces of paper to the bank. But now they just give me the equivalent of those pieces of paper, and they put it directly in the bank account for me. And then I trade the plastic for a car. Good deal. Without those other people working so hard, I wouldn't even have a car to drive. It's true, isn't it? What I just said, when we buy stuff, isn't it true? Hmm? We, we didn't make the stuff we buy. Hmm? We just trade plastic or paper for something useful. Because yeah, if you're stranded on a desert island alone, that plastic is not going to help you at all. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can't even use it as toilet paper. Yeah. Maybe if you have paper in that, but the kind of paper they have doesn't make very good toilet paper either. But really, you know, what use is it if you're all alone on a perfect desert island? Okay. Additionally, the giving of material wealth is able to cause enhancement of the faculties associated with the four physical elements. Four physical elements, earth, water, uh, heat, fire, and uh, wind. Okay. Uh, and when we give material wealth, it can enhance things that the earth element stands for being hard, the wet element for um, cohesiveness, fire element, heat, wind element, mobility. Yeah. So when we, uh, when we give or when people give to us material things made of these different qualities, uh, they get enhanced. Okay, that's what it's saying. Yeah, but, that, but the giving of the Dharma is able to bring about perfection of the absence of outflow impurities in the five faculties, the five powers, the seven limbs of enlightenment, and the eightfold path. If I explained all these terms right now, we would never talk about anything else. So just, um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear them later, and they'll get explained in some way. But essentially what it's saying is by giving dharma, we can uh, really help people improve the state of their mind. And when we say the word mind, we, my, the word mind doesn't mean just the intellect. It also means our heart. Okay, Buddhism doesn't differentiate between uh, intellect and emotions between what we might call intellect and heart. It's the same word used. So we often use the word mind, but it covers all of, all of these things. Okay, also for the methods of giving material wealth, they remain in the world constantly, whether or not there is a Buddha actually present in the world. As for the giving of dharma, it can only exist in an era where there has been a Buddha. Therefore, one ought to realize that the giving of dharma is extremely difficult. Material wealth is always available to give, and there's always some kind of, we have lots of dirt, you know, we can give you some dirt if you need it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, but the, the giving of the Dharma uh, can only occur at a time when the, um, a Buddha, an enlightened being, has manifested in the world and, and taught. Okay. So, uh, so the giving of the Dharma is very difficult. Yeah. How is it difficult? Even one who is a solitary realizer possessed of the marks of a great man, is still unable to speak dharma. Okay, I'm not going to explain all these terms because we'll never get beyond 
this page if I do. So I'll, tr I'll try and pick out the, po the important points, yeah. People who have some previous background will, will know the terms. So from the giving of the Dharma, one is able to generate the giving of material wealth while also being able to uh, progress spiritually. Yeah? So if we give the Dharma, <clears throat> often people like to support us so that we can continue that. So we get material wealth that then we can again give away and create good karma from that. Okay, so the giving of the Dharma, um, yeah, we're talking about the true character of phenomena, which is pure. Um, we're talking about its, uh, the impermanent nature of the things around us. Uh, we talk about the kindness of living beings. These are the kinds of things that are going on when we're giving the Dharma. And we're talking about also the antidotes to the afflictions, how to work with our mind when we're angry, how to work with our mind when there's incredible uh, um, grasping and craving, you know, wanting something. Okay, then Nagarjuna asks another question. The four kinds of relinquishing constitute what is known as generosity. These are relinquishing of wealth, relinquishing of dharma, relinquishing which leads to fearlessness, and the relinquishing of afflictions. Why have you not spoken herein of these uh, types of relinquishment? Okay, so it's interesting when we talk about generosity, if we're talking about material generosity, then we give material. So it's using the word relinquish. We relinquish our possessions to give somebody else. Okay, the idea is to do this with a happy mind, with a joyful mind. Sometimes the word relinquish. You know, I would prefer a different word. The word relinquish, it's like, well, I have it, but you want it, so I relinquish it. Or somebody's telling me to give it up. But this is talking about really an attitude where we're quite happy to give something. Yeah. Um, okay, then the relinquishing that leads to fearlessness is ethical conduct, okay? Because when we act in an ethical way, meaning we don't uh, harm other living beings or harm ourselves, yeah, then we have no cause to be afraid. When you think of it, why are we afraid? So much of our fear is because we've done something and that we're not very proud of, and we're afraid somebody else is going to find out, and then they will, you know, return the pleasure. Or um, it's fear because, too, we don't feel good about ourselves. Yeah, when we cheat or lie or whatever, uh, we may say, well, yeah, I, I got what I wanted. That was good. But when we're alone with ourselves and look over our own behavior, we don't feel very good. Yeah. So uh, when we keep good ethical conduct, uh, we, our self-confidence is better. <clears throat> and self-confidence is uh, often defined, well, not defined, but Self-confidence accompanies being fearless. Yeah, because when you have confidence, you're, you're not afraid of, you know, making a mistake or what other people think or anything like this. Yeah, when you have self-confidence, you're, you're comfortable in your own skin. You do what, what you do, and, and you feel good about it. Okay, so... When we keep ethical conduct, it brings about that kind of uh, good feeling. 
in ourselves and in others. Okay. Um, the relinquishment of the Dharma doesn't mean we're giving up the Dharma. It means we're sharing what we know. Yeah. And it would seem obvious that as human beings, we would want to share what we know. But uh, my brother told me an interesting example of not doing that. So my brother is a doctor, and he was telling me about being in medical school. And when it came time for exams, some of the medical students would go to the library and check out the books that everybody needed to use to study for the exams because they wanted to score better on the exams if they checked the books out, nobody else could get them. Yeah. And when we see in business, too, sometimes people are very stingy about their knowledge. They don't want to share with competitors. Yeah. So uh, here, with Dharma, there's, uh, you know, we give and there's, there's no... Uh, if we have stinginess in sharing the Dharma, then our mind is really out to lunch. It's really in bad shape, okay? But, we're, you know, we give the Dharma, we relinquish the Dharma by sharing. Okay, and then the, uh, the fourth relinquishing was relinquishing of our mental afflictions. Ignorance, anger, uh, hatred, greed, uh, these kinds of things. So these are uh, relinquished by, the, by using wisdom. So we want to develop wisdom, too. Okay. okay, so then he goes into an etymology of the word paramita, because uh, the six perfections, the word for perfection is paramita. Okay, so um, paramita refers to being able to cross on over a river, okay? So the perfection of generosity is to cross over the river of imperfect giving, yeah? To reach the other shore where the way we give is really quite beautiful and, and quite pure. Then he says, what is meant by failing to reach the other shore? Yeah, so you practice generosity, you want to reach the other shore, yeah, so that you can practice perfect generosity. But what's meant by failing to reach the other shore? And he says, it's analogous to crossing over a river, but returning before ha having arrived. Okay, so you're crossing over the river, and you change course midstream, okay. Now, here's a very interesting story. This uh, Nagarjuna, when he's explaining all these different things, he gives stories. Some of the stories don't make much sense to us. Some of the stories do make a lot of sense. Okay, this story makes a lot of sense, even though some of the details may not. But if we understand it properly, we'll under, uh, under, it'll make sense. And this story is also one that's found in the Tibetan tradition that uh, many of you may have heard. So it's about Shariputra, who was the Buddha's foremost disciple in terms of wisdom. Okay, So Shariputra cultivated the Bodhisattva path. So that's the path of love, compassion, altruism, aspiring to become a Buddha. So Shari, Shariputra cultivated the Bodhisattva path for 60 eons. Okay, we, we want to do everything, you know, maybe 60 days, 60 hours. Yeah, kind of do it, get it over with, perfect it, and then go on to the next thing. But Shariputra cultivated the Bodhisattva path for 60 eons, desiring to cross over the river to the farthest shore of giving. 
okay, to perfect his giving. At that time, there was a beggar who came along and demanded that Shariputra give him one of his eyes. Okay, now I know that doesn't happen very much here. I mean, it could happen, except usually if somebody wanted your eye, it would be, you know, your cornea after you've died and you've bequeathed your your eye, your, your corneas to other living beings. and Or, you know, somebody may say, can I have your kidney? Um, but, you know, it would be done in a, in a hospital. It wouldn't be just walking along the street and a beggar coming up and saying, uh, give me your kidney, you know, give me your eye. But, okay, so, but just don't demand that the, that the stories be culturally uh, 20th, uh, 1st century America, okay? Just, just go with it, okay? So he's, you know, Shari Pucha's walking along, some beggar comes up, you know, Bakshish, Memsa, Bakshish. No, he wouldn't say Memsa, he would say, what's Sa? Yeah, Memsa is for a woman, isn't it? Memsa, maybe, maybe he just did. Well, anyway, the beggar says, Give me, you know, give me the eye. Okay. At that, okay. So Shariputra said, the eye would then be useless. What do you want it for? If you need to put my body to use, or if you want any of my valuables, I'll give those to you. But just, you know, having my eyeball, what are you going to do with it? He says to the beggar. So the beggar said, I have no use for your body, and I don't want any valuables that you might own. I just want an eye, that's all. If you were truly a cultivator of the practice of giving, then I would receive an eye from you. So really, you know, okay, you know, walk the talk, Shariputra. So being boxed into a corner. Uh, that's not what it says in the text, but, uh, you know. At that time, Shariputra pulled out one of his eyes and gave it to the beggar. So, you know, I mean, this doesn't ha happen too much on the street. Somebody reaches in and pulls out their eye and gives this. But, you know, chill out. Just just go along with it, okay? There's a very, the, the meaning of the story is very important. Okay, so the beggar got the eye, and then right there in front of Shariputra, he sniffed it, and he cursed it. It stinks! And then he spat on the eye, and then he th threw the eye down on the ground, and then he smashed it with his foot. Okay, so imagine you had just given somebody your eye. You now are minus an eye. Yeah? And you're wondering what this guy needs it for. And he just takes it, you know. He, cur he says it stinks. He spits on it. He throws it on the ground, stomps on it. And you're going, but, but, but that's my eye, you know. Don't do that. So Shariputra thought, thought to himself, it's a difficult task to cross over such base people to liberation. <laughs> you know, it's like, how am I ever going to help this guy? Look what he did. He actually had no use for the eye at all. This is what Shariputra is saying. And he was uh, forceful in demanding it from me. Having gotten it, he not only threw it away, he even smashed it with his foot. How extremely base. What an obnoxious jerk this guy is. People of this sort cannot be brought, cannot be crossed over to liberation. You know, how can you lead them on a spiritual path when they act like this? It's far better that I just concentrate on disciplining myself so that I gain early liberation from the cycle of birth and death. 
Okay, so that at that moment, Shariputra, when confronted by this person who was so obnoxious and ungrateful, Shariputra thought, why in the world am I, world am I practicing the Bodhisattva path, trying to help everybody else attain a full awakening? You know, it's better I just get awakened for myself. Leave all these other people alone. It's just too hard to help them. Okay. Have you ever felt that way about somebody that you tried to help? Who did the very opposite of what you advised them? Even you gave them money, they spent it frivolously. You know, you tried to help them, they turn around and criticize you. Okay, so Shariputra was fed up. It's like people like him, the rest of these sentient beings, impossible to help. I'm just going to get myself out of this cycle of existence and stay in my own blissful personal peace. And everybody else can just do their own thing. Okay, so having thought thus, he turned from the bodhisattva path back towards the fundamental vehicle. This is what is meant by failing to reach the other shore. Okay, so he had started out wanting to attain full awakening, and then Shariputra just said, forget it. Okay, if one were able to advance straight ahead, refrain from retreating, and thus continue on to the completion of the Buddha path, this would constitute reaching the farthest shore. So this story is given um, many times in the, uh, the Sanskrit tradition of Buddhism. Have people heard that before? We are always warned, you know, for following that path, which is the tradition that we follow here, um, you know, to be very careful about getting really fed up if somebody betrays with your, tr your trust and saying, forget everybody else, you know, I'm just going to work for my own liberation. And they tell, tell this story. Mm -hmm. So here's at least, you know, Nagarjuna is quoting this story. I don't know the original source of it. I asked one of my Theravada friends if he had heard of it, and he hadn't. So I don't know its origin. Okay. So actually... Our time is over this evening. So think a little bit about, you know, about this story and what kind of situations uh, do you get fed up in? Or look at your own life. When, when have you started out with a kind intention and then somebody has betrayed your trust or hasn't re reciprocated in the way you think they have, they should, or they've, you know, they've thrown your eye on the ground and stomped on it. And so you've said, basically, to hell with them. Excuse my French. Um, yeah, the French don't like when I say that. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with our language? Yeah, but it's an, it's an American thing, isn't it? Yeah. Excuse my French. I don't say, excuse my Australian. <laughs> that might be more appropriate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. But to, to think of examples in our own life, and you know, what do we expect of other people when we give? And, and you know, what really pushes our buttons? You know what expect? Yeah, what expectation do they have? Do I? Do we have? I mean, they should at least say thank you, don't you think? Yeah, they should at least say thank you, and it wouldn't hurt if they return the favor too. That's not asking too much. And also, you know, we're being so kind to them; they should praise us behind our back, and not criticize us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't expect anything, but really from their side, yeah, they should say thank you, they should reciprocate, they should speak well of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I have no expectations. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we have plenty of expectations, and they're not met, and... <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, you know, then we sometimes can even regret when we've given something to somebody, yeah, because they haven't adequately uh, appreciated it. One time in, uh, I was in India and I made some um, book covers for, you know, we often would wrap our, uh, our Dharma books in book covers. And I wanted to make some book covers for my teacher. So I, I didn't have a lot of money, but I got some brocade, okay, really beautiful brocade. And I hand-stitched with my own hands, yeah, sitting alone in my room, just, you know, threading that needle, making these very careful stitches, cutting everything carefully to make a very beautiful, you know, a few, not just one, but a few very beautiful book covers. So I went in uh, to see my teacher one day, and I offered the book covers, and he very kindly accepted them, and he put them down on the table. And I left feeling very good. You know, gee, I made an offering to my teacher. He accepted it. It was a beautiful offering. It really came from my heart. And then I left. And then uh, one of his other monk friends, who was a geshe, uh, came in to, to see him. And I, I guess they visited for a while. And when this other monk left, what was he carrying? <coughs> The beautiful hand-stitched brocade book covers that I had given my teacher a half an hour ago. Yeah. So my teacher gave me a very big teaching. Yeah. He gave me a very big teaching there about... Check your mind when you give. Yeah. And actually, at that time, I was surprised to see uh, this other monk carrying the book covers. But thankfully, I remembered very quickly, you know, first of all, don't get mad at your teacher. That's, that doesn't help your Dharma practice. <laughs> Second of all, you know, don't, uh, expect things when when you uh, are generous because that doesn't help your dharma practice either. So my mind, you know, was okay. I just thought it was a very interesting event that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 